Hi everyone, this is uh, Intro to African History. Um, I'm Dr. Young, your instructor. Uh, it's necessary to begin this course with a discussion of uh, a number of issues. Um, uh, among these are some sort of political um, ideas and political forms, uh, some cultural issues, uh, some issues that have to do with social organization, uh, as well as just geography and topography, um, and a, a brief discussion of kind of the impact that geography has on human civilizations. And the goal here really is to establish a, a terminology, um, a set of shared terms that we're going to take with us all through the uh, the term here with or all through the semester um, with this course. Uh, and so um, this lecture will be somewhat eclectic. Um, we're going to be kind of moving around from one issue to another, uh, and it might seem somewhat disjointed, but hopefully um, if you pay close attention, take good notes, uh, you will come away from this with a, a really solid vocabulary uh, that you can use um, for uh, writing about African history, for conversing about African history. Um, this is a topic that, of course, is um, not well known, I think, to most students. And so I imagine that most of you are coming to this course with only perhaps a rudimentary knowledge, if that, uh, of the continent of Africa, of its peoples, and especially of its, uh, of its history. Um, first of all, some terminology that we uh, we'll use occasionally, but which we also might find problematic, okay? Um, the term civilization. I could have titled this course African Civilization. Um, I teach, for instance, courses on Western civilization. Um, and I think that the term civilization does apply to Africa, though maybe not uh, all uses of that term civilization. Um, but Africa did have civilization. Civilization means large-scale um, human society. Uh, civilization connotes complexity. Um, that this isn't just, you know, um, uh, say a hunter-gatherer band kind of wandering around uh, looking for food, looking for animals and roots and berries, that there is something beyond that. Um, how, and, and Africa certainly had large-scale complex civilizations uh, through much of its history, okay? Um, but we also need to appreciate things that, that might not be classified by that definition of the term as civilization. Uh, civilization has been used by interpreters of African history, and in particular uh, European interpreters of African history uh, or observers of the African continent as a way to distinguish the Western world from Africa, and also from other parts of the world. Asia was not considered by Europeans to be fully civilized, and certainly the Native Americans were not civilized according to European conceptions. Uh, and so civilization has been used as kind of this boundary term that the West is civilized and the rest of the world isn't, and, and that's especially the case uh, with Africa for sort of the European imagination, right? I think that that view is erroneous. Um, I want to try to get away from that. I also want to be cautious with other terms that tend to go along with this notion that Africa is somehow less advanced, less, uh, less, lesser in terms of progress. Um, things like primitive, words like primitive. Uh, we might, you know, uh, and you may have heard the word primitive used in a discussion of Africa, that these people live at somehow a lesser state of existence, a more primitive form of existence. Um, uh, in the, you know, 17th and 18th centuries, European philosophers like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Thomas Hobbes talked about something they called the state of nature which was this, a kind of uh, pristine state that human beings supposedly lived in. This was mostly just the realm of theory. Um, and certainly these thinkers were uh, contemplating the situation of, of peoples outside of Europe, uh, you know, peoples of the 
newly discovered continents uh, of the Americas um, as well as Africa. Um, and they, you know, compared themselves again uh, to these people and classified the peoples of these other places as primitive, as uh, having achieved a lesser state of advancement. Um, I think that the word primitive is um, highly problematic. I think that it absolutely halts inquiry if we are, um, you know, trying to understand someone and we, and we simply attach the label primitive to them, we will assume that they can't think in complex ways, uh, that they can't uh, produce institutions that have any, uh, any uh, complexity to them or anything like that, right? Um, Africa, in my opinion, is, and I, I think that I share this opinion with uh, the majority of scholars who work on Africa is decidedly not primitive. It has not been primitive. Um, the word primitive does not describe uh, adequately life in Africa, even among those peoples, you know, who participate in hunting and gathering and things like this. There is a complexity. There is certainly an ingenuity to uh, these peoples, um, and uh, so I, I want to get away from the words words like primitive. Okay, for the same reason. I loathe the word tribe and the adjectival form of that word tribal. Uh, I think that you know when we talk about people living in tribes, we automatically assume that they live in a more primitive state of existence than we do. That we are we have progressed beyond them. That we are somehow superior to them. Right now, I do like the word tribal as a descriptor for I think what is a, a general human tendency that is to. Uh, uh, to, to have loyalties to things, to identify. Uh, we are tribal in the sense that we identify with religions and ethnicities um, and uh, political parties. Um, we identify with, you know, families. Um, all of these things are tribal kind of in the broadest sense of this. And in that case, all human societies are tribal. All human individuals are tribal. But, you know, the word tribe is not often used that way in conjunction with Africa or with Native America um, or Australian Aborigines or you know, any of these uh, kind of native peoples of various continents. Um, and uh, rather it is used, again, to connote their primitiveness, right? And so I, I will be careful with the term tribe. Now, there is an associated term um, with tribe, and that is the, the, the word clan. Uh, clan tends to mean small group that ex that has some kind of unity, often through kinship. And tribe is a larger group. Uh, tribes are made up of multiple clans, according to this conception. And there are times when I will um, probably try to dance around these terms, and I might even end up using the terms clan and tribe. Anthropologists don't have a huge problem with these terms because they uh, use them in those senses, right? Um, it is true that Africans, like many other peoples, many other uh, societies in world history, um, have organized themselves into, uh, you know, uh, large kinship groups with smaller kinship groups uh, acting as components of the large kinship groups. Um, and the, you know, clan for the small one and, and tribe for the large one is really quite um, a good shorthand, I suppose. Um, and so from the anthropologist's viewpoint, these are still adequate terms. I have, you know, gotten into arguments with my anthropologist colleagues over this, um, uh, and I think they've stuck to their, you know, to their vocabulary. So uh, I, I just want to help you understand the complexity of a, a term like this, right? The problems of a term like this. Uh, so that when it comes up again, you know, we can have a, uh, uh, be on a, a sort of sure footing for that. Maybe most problematic of all is the term race. Um, race is a totally artificial category that uh, has come out of the notion, which is um, completely erroneous, um, that peoples of different, who, who have uh, you know, sort of seriously different physical characteristics, especially the color of their skin, were somehow biologically or perhaps genetically 
different, scientifically different from people who had other colors of skin, right? This was the assumption of the 18th and 19th centuries. This was the assumption that, um, you know, informed uh, racial thinkers in that period who came up with a whole science of racism. Racism was acceptable at that point, right? Um, uh, and it was really only with the atrocities of the 20th century, especially uh, the atrocities committed by the Nazis and their allies during World War II, um, that the term race took on a kind of problematic cast and that scientific racism was challenged. Um, uh, suffice it to say, and hopefully you already know this, and it really goes without saying, human beings are not genetically different from one another. Uh, a person with dark skin simply has more melanin in the skin, probably because of an adaptation from living in um, areas with greater exposure to the sun and thus greater protection uh, with the, the higher melanin content, uh, which gives them dark skin, right? Um, people who live in uh, higher latitudes, as it were, do not have as much melanin in their skin, but that really is the only basis for that. Uh, genetically, we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, and, uh, you know, the, this is, we, we are biologically the same, right? And genetically the same. Um, but race, you know, has subsequently, and I think especially in the second half of the 20th century and, and uh, still lingering with us, has taken on a kind of cultural connotation with the rejection of scientific racism Race has become a term uh, of identification. It's become, to use the, the term as I, as I used before, it's become a tribal term, right? That we identify with a particular race or not, right? And this is especially, I think, the case for uh, those races that are classified quite problematically, I, I might say, as minorities, in, meaning minorities in European and European-inspired countries like the United States, um, uh, and so, you know, th those who, um, uh, are not like others, uh, in physical characteristics have tend to be, have tended to be castigated and, and, uh, afforded second class status. Uh, this is not a revelation probably to any of us. Um, but, uh, you know, in response to that, they, uh, those peoples have often taken on race as a kind of ethnic identifier, as a, as a personal identifier. Now, in Africa, the vast majority of peoples are uh, have darker skin, right? They are not minorities, as it were. This is the norm, okay? Um, I lived in Africa when I was young um, and often uh, ventured into areas where I was the absolutely the only person or one of very few persons uh, who had light-colored skin, pink, pinkish-colored skin, right? Um, and I, I really don't like the term white either, just uh, for, for that reason. Anyway, uh, and, you know, I was a distinct minority, and I was looked at often like um, an exotic creature who had ventured in. Uh, little children especially would start to shout, Mahua, Mahua, uh, which is the, uh, the, the Tswana or the Sutu uh, word for, for white man, um, uh, or Malungu would be the Zulu. Um, and, uh, you know, after a while, I was so accustomed to it that I would wonder, you know, who they were talking about because I just felt so at home and so you sort of united with, uh, with these peoples. Um, but, uh, you know, that it can be um, a, a sort of shock to be in that, in that kind of position, right? So race has different meanings in Africa, certainly, than it does in other parts of the world, right? Um, uh, given the demographic circumstances. Race is mostly something that Europeans have applied to Africa uh, as an identifier, that people of other races live there. And so it's problematic. Um, we're not going to talk much about race uh, until you know we get to the modern period when Europeans introduce this into, um, uh, into the historical circumstances of Africa. Um, at this point in the course, if I were teaching this in the classroom, as I do, you know, quite frequently, uh, I would stop and ask if there are other terms that you um, have heard associated with Africa. Uh, feel free to chime in on the discussion board. In fact, um, 
you know, this is one of the questions that uh, uh, might animate really good discussion here. So uh, feel free to, to weigh in on this, and I'd love to, to talk about this with you. Now, uh, the word historiography means um, the trends through uh, that characterize the treatment of history, meaning uh, the way that history has been interpreted over time. Okay, hopefully that was not too unclear, right? Uh, in other words, this is this is sort of the history of history, okay? Um, and uh, the history of history interpretation, as it were. Um, and we have to be aware of the way that African history has been treated over time um, in order to, you know, arrive at some of the, or, or to, to deal with some of the basic assumptions that people might have about Africa uh, that often linger with us, the way African history has been treated influences uh, sort of the, the common understanding of Africa, for instance. Um, we also ought to be aware of these trends so that we can choose uh, which sorts of interpretations we want to take with us and which ones we want to reject. Okay, I have already given some of this away in saying that uh, that Europeans, who uh, you know Europeans really um, in some well certainly uh, were the founders of professional history. That is history as an academic discipline in higher education, right, um, and in high culture. Um, and uh, that, that really is dated to the 19th century, though we could go all the way back to Herodotus and Thucydides in ancient Greece uh, and find antecedents for that. Um, and, but, but the problem is the way that Europeans do history, the way they interpret history, the way they work with history, the kinds of materials they rely on to write about history, all of these things don't fit well with an exploration of the African past. And as a result of this, Euro uh, European-based historians, meaning uh, people who are Western historians, let's put it that way, we could talk, be talking about Americans too, uh, have tended to struggle with the interpretation of African history, have often given up and just concluded that Africa has no history. Um, in fact, in the, you know, in the early 1960s, as late as that, you know, uh, just over a half century ago, one of the foremost practitioners of history, um, an Oxford University historian named Hugh Trevor Roper, said, um, wrote, I should say, Africa has no history. Not at present. There is only, and I'm paraphrasing him, but I... I may be quoting partially uh, directly here. Uh, there, may, there is only the history of Europeans in Africa. Perhaps at some future date we might be able to talk about African history or write about African history, but they don't have it right now. Um, and then he goes on to say that all Africa presents us is the, and I will quote here, the, quote, unrewarding gyrations of primitive peoples in picturesque but irrelevant corners of the globe, close quote. Okay. The unrewarding gyrations of primitive peoples. Um, in other words, in, in uh, the words of Hugh Trevor Roper, Oxford Don, um, you know, professor of history, uh, Africa really had no history because history, in his mind, uh, was about things that Europeans were doing. It was about forming large-scale governments and uh, instituting the rule of law and writing constitutions and, you know, fighting large-scale wars and whoever, you know, who knows what else uh, he, was, he was thinking of there, and he didn't find any of this in Africa. Now, hopefully you, like I, uh, have a, a visceral response to that uh, and say, hey, there's just got to be something wrong with what he's saying here. That's not only racist, but it's also ignorant. Um, uh, I think that this, this is highly problematic. Um, but uh, I want to make sure that we are equipped with the tools to explain why it's problematic. Okay. Um, so, first of all, okay, now, one of the problems that European historians, professional historians, 
I've encountered in the study of African history um, is a source problem. Historians need sources uh, in order to understand, to, to study the past, right? That is, they need things that people produced in the past in order to understand them. Um, and from the 1830s, when history really was established as an academic discipline uh, in Germany at the beginning uh, and spreading from there, okay, um, historians have relied almost entirely on written sources, the kinds of things that Europeans have produced in large numbers, um, charters. Uh, account books, um, journals, letters, and so forth and so on. Okay, uh, even like official histories of you know military campaigns or uh, monasteries or you know whatever it is. Right, um, Europeans have had a habit, at least the uh, literate and, and elite and educated among them, which is you know, for much of European history even been a, a fairly small minority of. But Europeans have been accustomed to producing written works that survive on fairly durable materials. Uh, animal skin, parchment, for instance, papyrus, um, and eventually paper, which, although it is a rather fragile material, as long as it's put in circumstances where it doesn't get wet or exposed to insects or get burned, uh, all three of those can happen you know, pretty, pretty rapidly. Uh, but if it's, it's kept in those kinds of conditions, um, paper tends to keep pretty well. Okay. Um, Africa did produce written sources, um, certainly in regions that were dominated by the religion of Islam, uh, as well as places where Christianity really took hold. These were literate, text-based religions. And people who adhered to these religions would often learn how to write, at least the educated among them, okay? Um, at least the elites, the ones who were the uh, overseers of the religion, the priests in the Christian, sorry for all the yawns here, um, didn't get much sleep last night. Uh, uh, the priests in the Christian setting in, say, Ethiopia, or the, um, the imams, or the ulama, uh, in the Muslim tradition, uh, in places like the Niger Valley in West Africa, uh, cities like uh, Jenne and Timbuktu, um, uh, and then merchants, you know, uh, Muslim merchants on the eastern coast of Africa, uh, produced written sources, right? This was important to them. These sources are in Arabic uh, in the Muslim tradition, um, in uh, especially the Ethiopian language of Ge'ez, um, though even to some extent in Greek uh, and Coptic and, and these languages of the Mediterranean, right? Um, so Africa does not have a complete paucity or a complete uh, lack of written sources. However, many of the societies that have existed in African history were not literate. That doesn't mean they were primitive. It doesn't mean that they were backward somehow. Uh, they had methods of keeping records that were for them just as efficient um, and that fit with their culture uh, just as efficient, uh, just efficiently and, and as well as written records did for European societies and for the Muslim and Christian uh, countries in the northern part of Africa. Okay. But that means that those methods of keeping records had to be passed from person to person orally, right? Now, if there's a way to tap into this, some of those oral traditions are still very much alive in Africa today. Uh, the, the lore has been kept by, say, the griots of West Africa, um, about whom we will learn quite a bit as the semester goes on. Um, or the... Um, uh, you know, the Sangomas of Southern Africa, um, uh, who were given pejoratively the name Witch Doctor by European observers, um, they, they kept records. Um, they told stories about their people. 
Now, oral tradition is not as durable um, uh, in terms of like not changing as written records are. Once something is written down on a page, unless that page is lost, you know that record is a pretty permanent thing. Um, but or it can be tampered with, I suppose too. Um, but uh, you know, oral sources are less durable. You know, and and uh, to some extent, we have to account for you know the phenomenon of the game of telephone, right? Where somebody says something to somebody else, and maybe they don't hear it exactly, or they don't remember exactly what was said, and so when they pass it on, uh, it's in a slightly different form, right? And over time, the oral tradition is going to change. Now, historians still work with oral sources, right? Uh, my own teacher, um, Emily Osborne, uh, who was at Notre Dame and now is at the University of Chicago, I believe, um, unless she's moved on to somewhere else, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, she, um, her research dealt mostly with uh, interviewing oral uh, historians in Africa, um, interviewing uh, lore keepers, the, the griots of West Africa, and learning their stories and trying to sort of pick through that and, and obtain historical information. But this is this requires a different methodology than the study of written records does. Um, it requires an accounting for that uh, drift in the, in, the, uh, in the stories over time, um, an attempt to discover uh, things that, uh, you know, may be hidden beneath the oral tradition as it exists in the modern world. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, th there are well-established methodologies for this. We're not going to necessarily learn uh, in great detail those methodologies, though we will deal with some texts that were oral traditions for a very long time and have only been written down in fairly recent times, only in the last, you know, uh, the last century or so. In addition to written and oral sources, um, uh, we also have archaeology, and for some regions of Africa, the archaeology is very rich, right? Um, Large-scale civilization in West Africa through what we call the Middle Ages of Europe, for instance. Um, you know, the empires of Ghana and Mali and Songhai um, and uh, other entities um, have built large-scale buildings, some of which survive uh, all the way to the present, having been built centuries ago. Um, but uh, archaeology does not is not just about monumental architecture, of course. Um, it's also about you know what people used in their everyday lives, their trash, their utensils, their tools. Um, and for much of Africa, although there are exceptions to this. That's also problematic. It's tough to get at the archaeology because, as we're going to find out, people moved a great deal in Africa. And they only took with them what they absolutely needed. They did not own a lot of durable goods. Um, and so, you know, finding the material remains of people who lived um, in societies like that is often very difficult. Now, um, in addition to that, you know, we have, I mean, folklore is, is really oral tradition. Um, artwork, uh, often spectacular artwork, though, um, uh, again, I mean, there are, there are all kinds of problems in using art. It's a very promising potential, you know, set of sources, but uh, one has to develop, um, you know, very careful methodologies to, to use art as a historical source. And then a couple of others that very creative and very ambitious historians have used. Uh, one of these is simply biological, that is material remains of people. Right? Uh, and you can actually learn quite a bit about them. Um, I remember when I was a graduate student, there was um, an opportunity. I didn't take it because I was married and had some children. Um, but uh, one or two of my colleagues did this where they got to go to a monastery, uh, I can't remember exactly where this was, I think it was in Italy somewhere, um, and uh, study the biological remains of the monks there. Okay, And one of the things that they found was that these people had uh, a lot of uh, extra tissue on their kneecaps. And I might, if I were in class with you, ask why would that be the case, and, and uh, 
hopefully at least one of you would be able to answer, well, they probably spend a lot of time on their knees because monks tend to pray a lot, right? Well, that's interesting information, okay? If there is sort of scarification on the knees, you know, that means that they, those knees have been, have been subjected to physical stresses that have produced the scarification. Um, and so, uh, you know, for, for Africa, we can study the biological remains of people and potentially come up with some interesting information about them. Um, and some of that work has been done, again, by very creative historians. And then finally, linguistics. Okay, Now, it's, it's difficult to even characterize the methodologies here. But Africa is home to a dizzying variety of linguistic material. There are literally hundreds of independent languages in Africa. Some countries, like sole countries, like Nigeria, has upwards of 250 different languages or dialects. Okay, Some of which are rather close to each other, but some of which, you know, even in fairly close proximity, uh, are, you know, belong to totally different language families. Right? Now, as people, sorry again for the yawn, uh, as people who speak different languages interact with each other, they borrow words from each other. They borrow terms. And we can, you know, if there is a, a word in one language that seems to be out of place or abide by the rules of, uh, you know, that are germane to another language, another set of language family, another language family or something like that, then we can learn something about the history of the people who spoke that language. Okay? Um, there is even this well-developed and incredibly ambitious kind of sub-discipline called glutochronology, which, um, let me see if I can characterize this in a way that you will be able to make sense of. Uh, so the kind of godfather of this, actually there are two scholars, Christopher Errett, who was many years at UCLA, and Jan van Sina, who spent much of his career at the University of Wisconsin. Um, both of and these two, by the way, didn't get along very well and, and kind of hated each other, um, but that's a, that's an irrelevant point. Uh, in, in one study that I have used in other classes, van Sina takes a set of languages from Southern Africa, um, this is like 40 different languages or something like that, that are spoken all through this region that kind of skirts the southern part of the, the Central African rainforest and moves down into the very arid regions close to the Kalahari Desert. Okay, and I'll go through the geography here in a few minutes and that'll make more sense if you don't know what that means. Um, but, uh, um, Anyway, he, he, you know, he takes this whole set of languages with the assumption that these all developed from earlier languages. In fact, uh, the assumption is that they all developed from a single language because they're all part of the same language family. Okay? And he looks for common roots in this language. And once he's identified those, then he tries to understand. So, and now those roots would all theoretically at least belong to the original languages from which these others descended, uh, off of which they branched, right? Um, and, you know, these would be very important words like um, the word for, say, iron, right, which these people had in their technology. Um, uh, words like mother and father probably are very similar across these things. Um, and uh, as they are, by the way, in Indo-European languages, you know, they're, uh, the, the word father in, um, in English is very similar to the word Vater in German, for instance, right? Um, or mother is similar to the word mère in French. Um, uh, so, you know, we can see this in, in European languages too. Um, and, you know, those, those would be very important words that were common, you know, in the, 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 for the speakers of the original language from whom the speakers of these other languages are descended. But if there are, you know, some of this set of languages have, have terminology that other languages in the set don't have, well, that means that they developed that after they split off of each other. 
And often these are words for, for technology, for specific crops or uh, for things that are germane to cattle raising or something like that, right? And, you know, looking back at all of this, sort of charting it out, one can begin to detect that at some point, and maybe even, you know, they apply uh, logarithms to this that allow them to say that over the course of so, so many years, languages, you know, diverge uh, at this percentage or something like that. Okay, and so that would enable one to go back and, and apply almost a chronology to this. So, you know, Vancina is able to say fairly confidently that about 300 years uh, ago or 1300 years ago or whatever it is, uh, people's, you know, migrating across Africa arrived in this region where they encountered plants that they hadn't uh, been exposed to before or where they, you know, ventured out of an area with a high level of rainfall into a rather arid area. And so they had to change uh, what they were doing to grow food or to produce food, right? And so they developed new terminology. And ultimately, the result is a fairly well-established, very creative chronology, right? Um, a history of these people based entirely on the analysis of languages. Now, um, just to set your mind at ease, I am not going to ask any of you to replicate any kind of project like this, right? There is no prerequisite of learning 40 African languages in order to, to do well in this course. Um, but we should appreciate that, you know, Africa forces the historian, the student of history, to adapt, to use sources that are maybe unfamiliar to them. Um, uh, things that, you know, other historians wouldn't ever think of using, but because the traditional sources like written documents are not available in Africa, uh, historians have to come up with some other way, some other sources to use to tell the history of this place, right? Um, and so African historians are, you know, they are the, um, the practitioners of a history that is intensely creative, um, often quite work intensive, um, but still incredibly creative. Now, one of the basics, and I've kind of already commented on this, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but there are very different conceptions of history in Europe than there are, you know, in Africa. Africans did tell stories about their past from time out of mind, right? These were often oral traditions. Uh, some of them were written down in places like Ethiopia and, again, in, in Muslim-dominated lands. Um, but uh, uh, even there, even with the written documents, the ideas about what was important to keep in the historical record often um, diverge sharply from what Europeans would consider important. Now, coming into the more modern period, Europeans, again, approached African history, and this is to go back to Hugh Trevor Roper, uh, approached African history by saying, well, you know, we're not finding the kinds of things that we find in European history, therefore Africans must have no history, right? On the other hand, Africans do have a history, um, and they have a very highly developed sense of history. Uh, at least many peoples of Africa do. I realize it's highly problematic to talk about Africans because this continent is so huge and so diverse, and so, you know, I'm going to keep kind of checking myself uh, as, I, as I tend to do that. Um, but uh, African peoples, plural, uh, many of them, most of them, maybe all of them, um, have considered the past to be important, but maybe for reasons that are highly different from those that Europeans consider important. Right? Um, now, in the 1960s and 1970s, as African nations had gained their independence and as universities were founded in African countries, uh, history became an academic discipline studied by Africans. Um, and they wanted to, to study their own history. They wanted to study the history of Africa. And these historians, some of them at least, came up with uh, it borrowed from traditional notions of history and came up with very different approaches to history that have been highly influential in the study of African history. Right? So we need to go back and forth 
to some extent between kind of European or Western conceptions of history and African conceptions of history and appreciate both of those and see how both of those are in some way problematic as well. European assumptions about African history are informed by numerous things, um, uh, which I think all to some extent lead Europeans astray in their interpretation of African history. One of these is the idea of progressivism, really an enlightenment concept that the world can be improved by the application of knowledge and uh, technology, um, by learning how the world works and, and uh, sort of harnessing the power of nature to, uh, to make human life easier, right? Um, that's very much an enlightenment concept. It's very much something that informs uh, the Western world all the way to the present um, in the 19th century. There were even schools of history that were based on this notion of progressivism. Uh, Europeans, uh, Karl Marx was one, but there were, were lots of others, often set up these kind of periodization schemes. Marx's went, you know, the most uh, basic and, and the most oppressive system was what he called feudalism. I'm not going to get into the intricacies of feudalism and the complexities of that term. Come take my class on medieval Europe if you're interested in that. Uh, but, you know, feudalism then gives way to what he calls capitalism. And capitalism would inevitably, as he, as he foresaw, give way to communism, right? That's a progressive notion of history, that it develops over time to the improvement of society. Um, you know, I think Marx was uh, not a very um, good prophet in that, uh, in, in that way, um, not uh, that, you know, not, not enough countries, certainly from, from his predictions, became communist uh, in order to justify his read of history. Um, and certainly those who did, that did become communist experienced not the sort of utopia that Marx envisioned, but, but often, um, you know, the, the problems of a command economy and things like this. Okay. So we get a sense of, you know, the progressive view of history that, that uh, human societies proceed through stages. The most common of these was not Marx's conception, which is very much an economic one, but rather the three-phase schema that went, the first phase, savagery. Okay. That is the primitive human condition. Again, what you know, Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau called the state of nature, where humans are really only satisfying their basic urges for food and sex and shelter uh, and comfort and things like that. That's what they're interested in. Um, and then they proceed to develop more complex systems of organization, but these are often... Um, uh, in the service of some kind of uh, exploitative entity, right? A king um, or a nobility uh, or something like that who you know, bases their power in their ability to fight. Uh, this is a, um, what these European progressive historians called uh, barbarism, okay? The barbaric phase of human societies. Um, higher than savages, but still problematic and barbaric is just as pejorative a term as savages. Um, and then finally, you know, moving beyond that, we arrive at what the Europeans considered civilization. Okay. Now, this, you know, it, I think it almost goes without saying that at Europeans looking at Africa and not understanding the complexities of African societies would have automatically classified Africans as savages, as primitive peoples who had really not gotten beyond their um, their quest for to, to satisfy their basic urges. Um, that view is is so problematic and so erroneous that um, hopefully I don't even need to, to tell you that, and you can already sense that. Okay, but this has influenced Africa the, the study of African history, at least from the European perspective. Uh, I recall even as an undergrad having um, a conversation, an extended conversation in a class um, which was delving into question, you know, kind of the history of racism and things like this. Uh, the, the professor who was rather provocative, you know, came in and said, um, is Europe more, uh, has it progressed beyond Africa? Like, you know, is Africa primitive relative to Europe? Um, and I don't think the professor thought that, but he was willing to let the discussion go. And I was truly shocked. I mean, I had lived in Africa for a couple of years. 
uh, previous to this, I was truly shocked to hear student after student uh, who I don't, you know, think would ever consider themselves racist defend the proposition that, you know, Europe was so much more highly advanced than Africa that I really couldn't apply the word civilization to Africa or anything like that. I was disgusted. And their, their basis for this was, well, Europeans have technology, right? That we had the steam engine and the cotton gin and the fulling mill. And, you know, today we might say we have the smartphone or the computer or whatever, right? Um, and that makes us somehow better and more developed than peoples in these other continents. I think if you apply only criteria that are germane for the European or the Western world, then of course you're going to see that. But that also keeps us from understanding Africa on its own terms, which I, I want to try to do. Now, I already talked about scientific racism. This was an accepted viewpoint in the 19th century. Uh, there was even um, a well-embraced notion that human beings had not even descended from the same stock originally. That he said that, you know, the different races had proceeded along different evolutionary lines is what's known as the polygenesis theory. Um, uh, that is, you know, we, we didn't all, from the Judeo-Christian viewpoint, descend from Adam and Eve, that, you know, black people, African people probably came from some different source, and thus they are but to the minds of those who embrace these notions, not fully human. There are different species that looks human, right? And thus they can be treated like animals. Um, this was used to justify slavery. It was used to justify the reprehensible treatment of African peoples. And it went into the study of African history. Again, this notion that, that Africa doesn't really have a history. Uh, the term dark continent, right, um, which has multiple meanings, also contributed to this. Uh, I could talk about each of these terms at length. If there are any that come up and I don't treat these fully, feel free to uh, bring them up in the discussion board. I'd be happy to talk about them even more. Uh, we also have what we might call colonial apologies. During the colonial era, um, there is this, you know, some European literary figures, Rudyard Kipling um, comes most readily to mind, the great English poet of imperialism, um, the writer of Kim and the Jungle Book and you know, some of these other um, novels. Uh, but uh, Kipling composed a poem in 1899 called The White Man's Burden, um, which talks about Africans being primitive peoples and, and Europeans having a responsibility to bring these poor, benighted, backward, tribal, primitive, dark, how many other adjectives can I use to describe uh, this you know, 19th century conception, uh, African people into Christianity and civilization and capitalism and all the things that enable Europeans to live better lives, right? Um, and, you know, contained within that is this stinking sense of, superiority that Europeans had relative to Africans and, and uh, Aboriginal peoples in other parts of the world. Um, uh, the colonial apologies are just kind of a mask, um, a humanitarian mask for atrocities um, and for oppression. Uh, but they do, of course, influence the European view of African history. And then finally, the American setting. The fight for civil rights and desegregation and all of this brought many um, African Americans, people who descended from African peoples, uh, into touch with their African roots, sometimes in problematic ways. Um, and we may talk about some of these uh, later in the course. Um, but uh, this did bring an interest to Africa and in some ways reinvigorated. There was a lot of communication between, you know, people, these, these African Americans and uh, African um, uh, diaspora intellectuals in the Caribbean um, and African intellectuals in Africa itself, right? Um, and all of these things were kind of mutually reinforcing and helped to bring about the sense that Africa needs to tell its own story, okay? Now, African historiography, um, 
Uh, we might discuss, for instance, that native colonial officials, Europeans living in Africa, did write histories of their place uh, in, in talking with the people there. Um, and so that is the, these can be actually quite valuable sources that we have to take them with a grain of salt. Uh, because, you know, the, the um, European writer, in this sense, often collaborated with or communicated with local historians, keepers of the oral literature, right? Um, and so, you know, this brought together these European sensibilities with, with actual African sources that told African stories rather than European stories. Uh, the independence movements, though, and so that, that's, that's really what we might call African history, you know, in a colonial period. Uh, the independence movements of the 50s and 60s brought a whole new emphasis to the, or rather added uh, oomph to the African desire to study their own history, to know their own history, to take pride in their own history, right? And this led to, as I said earlier, the establishment of African universities and ultimately to a kind of school of thought that we call the Afrocentrist school. One that emphasizes the centrality of Africa that doesn't place it on the margins, but rather uh, tries to appreciate it on its own terms for its own achievements, right? Often, often Afrocentrist, at least early Afrocentrist history is highly problematic too. Um, the historian Walter Rodney, uh, who wrote about how Europe purposefully underdeveloped Africa, uh, for instance, and really sort of, you know, uh, uh, accused Europeans of keeping Africans from developing in ways that they, they would have if left to their own devices, uh, ways that would have left them much better off than they were under European rule. Uh, and especially the Afrocentrist historian Sheikh Anta Diop, um, a Senegalese uh, historian, I think he's Senegalese, might be Ghanaian. Um, anyway, um, but uh, you know, he wrote about this grand African heritage that goes back, as he saw it, to ancient Egypt. Um, and you know, he saw the Egyptians as the sort of progenitors of all of African history and other African peoples as just following in their wake. Um, that is, that, that's really a problem. Um, Diop does not, he's not careful with his sources. Uh, but this, what, these were important moments in the historiography of Africa because, you know, these were Africans or people, intellectuals in the African diaspora writing about their own people and appreciating their own people for what they were able to do and for the history that they had and not uh, adding in this implicit or explicit uh, comparison with European societies. Right? In more recent times, um, African historians have particularly emphasized economic history, have looked at the, you know, the, I mean, the developments of um, different economic mechanisms. Uh, the history of slavery has often been um, uh, kind of couched in, in this terminology um, and, and have talked, you know, followed in Walter Rodney's uh, wake in talking about underdevelopment that Africa has been underdeveloped, especially in the colonial period, and they're trying to catch up. Um, uh, but that Africans are capable, even on their own terms, not necessarily even on European terms, on their own terms of developing to a high level of civilization. And then this in turn has influenced the way that Europeans and Americans have written about African history, that Afrocentricity uh, has crept into this. Um, I personally you know, my approach is to try to be as Afrocentric as possible, to treat Africa on its own terms, uh, to talk about, you know, the way Africans would understand things rather than uh, apply a kind of outsider's perspective to any of this. Okay. And in more recent scholarship, there's been a great emphasis on environmental history. Um, that is the impact that the environment has had on human societies um, and uh, also on a lot of social issues, which we will bring up. I know that was a lot, uh, and, and hopefully this has not been too overwhelming for you. Um, I do uh, want to move on briefly um, and talk about a few other things, but I'm going to save that for uh, a second lecture. I think that this has gone on long enough um, for now, and I want to give you a break. So thank you very much.